Keener. Welcome to Apollo Watered. Great to be with you, Apollos. <laughs> I don't know. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I am not Apollos, but we can we, we can have Apollos Watered. So are you ready for the Fast Five? I guess we'll find out. Okay. So here's, here's the first question. I'm going to set it up. You went to Duke and you live in Kentucky. So here we go. Duke Blue Devils or the Kentucky Wildcats? Oh, boy. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I spend most of my time doing research. I knew I was going to flunk the five. I, I so I don't really actually. Um, yeah, You're not I'm, a sports guy. You're not, not a, sports, a guy. sports guy. Sorry. That's okay. But you put, no, there's nothing to be sorry about, but you mentioned <laughs> blue devils in the blue devils in the book. Yeah. You mentioned it yeah. in the book. I, I do. Yeah. I do sort of root for them, but not because of their name, Blue Devils. It actually was named after <laughs> World War II squadron. I don't know where they got their name, but yeah. Okay. All right. How about this though? Now this Part one, I know, you, I know this one you'll be able to answer because you've traveled around the world. So the strangest food you've ever eaten. I, I guess my favorite of the strangest was some green bread in Indonesia. I really like Green that. bread? Like green yeah. eggs and ham kind of thing? Like, what are we talking about I, here? Green bread. I assume it was vegetable bread of some sort, but uh, maybe it was food coloring. But yeah, I liked it. <laughs> green bread. I'll have to yeah. look that up. All right. You're also a professor. So what is the funniest? Uh, what is the, actually, you've traveled around and you're a professor, but what is the funniest cross-cultural experience you've ever had? Oh, now this one is actually, well, it's funny in retrospect but it, it actually didn't come from teaching per se. It was after my wife and I got married. My, my wife is from Congo Brazzaville. I would say, je t'aime, I love you. Yeah. And Instead of saying, je t'aime wa aussi, I love you too. She would say, merci, thank you. And I, and I walked through like, oh, my wife is lovely. <laughs> and, and she was like, why is he so sad? And, and, you know, you didn't, you wouldn't realize that culture actually goes down to things like that. But, but yeah, I mean, in her, in her culture, the appropriate response is gratitude. Whereas in our culture, what you expect is reciprocity. It was just a cultural difference. And, you know, once we understood it, we were able to fix it. But yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's kind of funny and sad. At the same yeah, it was time. sad at the time. <laughs> But okay, now let's get to the professor part of it. What's the funniest classroom moment? Not necessarily intercultural, but what's the funniest classroom moment you've ever had? That one I don't have a good answer for. You don't? Nothing's crazy has happened in your class? Oh, all sorts of crazy stuff. But uh, but I, do, I don't really have um, one particular one that I can think of offhand. Okay, well, if you think of something, we'll get to add it back. I can think right? of the most embarrassing one. Okay, well, let's go with that. Let's go with the most embarrassing classroom moment. I'm all for that. When I was uh, starting to teach, I, I, um, I was getting frustrated because I felt like some of the students weren't getting it, how important it is to not just use the Bible to decorate your sermons, but to actually take your message from Scripture. Yeah. And, and I said, look, if you're not going to respect the Bible enough to take your message from the Bible, then you may as well just, you know, quit pretending that you have the authority of scripture when you speak. Mm. And one of my students said, you are the most arrogant person I have ever met. <laughs> it was good, good to bring me down a few notches. <laughs> they, they said that in class? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you respond? Because that's not funny. That I mean, that's funny, but it's, well, At that's why I said it, it was embarrassing. Funny. I had to, I had to, yeah, had to um, learn a bit more humility. But <laughs> oh yeah, I still believe I, we need to work from the Bible. But I have to find gracious ways, I guess, to communicate that. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, then let's go with our last and final question. This one's a little bit odd, but I want to see where you go with it because well, sometimes we like to. That one will work. Okay. Well, how about this one? If you, were, this is going to sound dumb. If not, I'm going to edit this out. I'm going to change the question. But if you were a donut, okay, what kind of donut would you be and why? You, you should have, I don't have a good answer for that. Okay, how about this one? If you were a restaurant, what restaurant would you be and why? Well, 
I usually go to Subway. It's the quickest restaurant in town. Okay. So quick. You like things that are quick. You like to quick, get down to the... And it needs to be healthy and it needs to be affordable. And well, so we only have a handful of restaurants in town. There is another restaurant that's really... Actually, there's a couple, a couple others. There's a Chinese restaurant. They grow their own vegetables. So that's impressive. Mm. And there is another restaurant in town that is um it, it's a bit you know higher mm-hmm. not it's called solomon's porch and, oh. and and they they do a really good job and they have they actually have like uh Ser- servetus burgers that are slightly well done they have uh, <laughs> calvin sandwiches wesley sandwiches <laughs> the c.s lewis you know they have i mean it's really uh, kind of kind of interesting. It tells you something about th- this being a, a college and seminary town, but anyway. <laughs> Servita's sandwiches, like well done. Cause they, yeah, because like he was like burned, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so bad. Yeah. What is it like an Isaiah sandwich that's cut in half? I mean, what what do we do? What do we do with this? Yeah. Oh, okay. But, but, well, but see, I'm an I'm a night person, and these are, you know, they're only open till till 2 p.m. usually so i i don't get there very much uh, despite the theological interest <laughs> well then let's well as we're talking about that you're a night guy you mentioned that actually in your book and that's what we're going to talk about today is your book miracles today um and i i was very interested in this book because and we talked about this a little bit in the kind of pre-show walkthrough um because there is a movement of the spirit of God. We know that most people do believe in miracles, but there is a, a part of the world that really doesn't. And it's even within the church, even though the new Testament's filled with them. But why did you write this book, which is actually something you had written about about 10 years ago in a two volume set. This is a smaller book, but tell us the reason why this book or how this book came to be. Well, the, the two volume set, it's like 1100 pages and it was too detailed for most people. I mean, you'd have people online quoting it uh, who were, you know, like, yes, this proves our case. And other people saying, no, this book is trash. And mm. you could tell by reading what they were saying online that, that neither of, of them had actually read it. Well, you know, it's 1100 pages. <laughs> it was kind it's of a lot big, of book. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, okay, a smaller version would help. But also, I had so many more cases that I could talk about, you know, so I wanted something more readable. I wanted something uh, shorter and far less expensive. And Baker Academic did a great job with this in terms of making it affordable. And then I also wanted to update it. So like 70% of the material is new. I didn't spend as much time on philosophy of science. I kind of summarized that. The first book I had to spend so many (laughs) I had to spend so long acquainting myself more with philosophy of science, uh, philosophy of history that was closer to what I do, and then um, anthropology that was that was fine. It was the philosophy of science part that was really uh, stretched my brain. But mm. th- this one, you know, I, I I summarize those more and just go for the um, kind of the evidence uh, that 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 we have. Um, where we have medical documentation and where we have multiple independent witnesses and and so forth. Well, so what was the original impetus behind, behind the two volume set that you wrote in 2011? It was a footnote. It I was I was working on my my four volume Acts commentary, which now also there's a condensed version with Cambridge, but the four volume one was with Baker Academic. Uh, it's 4,500 pages. And I was dealing with the historical reliability of acts and I got to the question, you know, the, the objection that is often raised, well, how can you say it's historically reliable when it recounts miracles? Eyewitnesses would never talk about this. I'm like, you guys have no idea. <laughs> mm. I, and so I, I said, well, what I'll do, I'll just, for this footnote saying, uh, this objection is clearly wrong. Eyewitnesses do report things like this, uh, however you want to explain them. I was I was going to just go find a, a few books that just listed a number of these uh, eyewitness cases, medical documentation, and so on, 
Um, eventually I did find some, there was a really good, um, actually master's thesis, but it was on dissertation level from the, from like 1980 something and a number of other works. Um, one, one, a couple by doctors, uh, one of them actually had the medical documentation in the book uh, from, the, from the 70s and 80s, but I wasn't finding initially as much as I'd hoped. I was finding an account here, an account there, and I just started compiling them and the footnote grew and grew. And after a couple hundred pages, we decided maybe it should be a separate book. <laughs> so, so you're saying you're doing this commentary on Acts and that led you to want to understand miracles that were happening in the contemporary world that were documented? Yeah, yeah, because I, I wanted to show that the, the claim that eyewitnesses never claim this stuff is simply false. And you, you can't say that nobody would have claimed this back then if we have other reason to trust the sources there's that you can't say this stuff didn't happen back then when you have eyewitnesses claiming this stuff today. So mm. there's no reason to say this couldn't go back to eyewitness sources back then. Mm. It doesn't prove that it does, but it also disproves the very misinformed idea that, that it couldn't. Well then let's, let's start with that then. Um, and, and, you know, we're being in the West here. We always want to give a definition, especially when we're talking about miracles, because there are different definitions. The sun rises every morning. That's a miracle. We've heard those kind of things, <laughs> but describe a miracle or define a miracle in the way you're using it so that we might understand going forward further. Yeah, that's kind of the problem. It's like the, um, th there are so many definitions of it. And so, the historic definition was a special act of God. So not just his ordinary working that he does on a regular basis, but something different from that, that's dramatic enough to cause awe, to get people's attention for what God is doing, uh, since they often don't pay attention to his regular working, which actually is often, you know, I mean, it's greater a greater sign, but mm -hmm. um, no, since David Hume, in uh, he was a, a Scottish philosopher a few centuries ago, he's the way he defined it. He tried to define miracles out of existence, so he didn't have to really ar offer an argument. He just, uh, well, at least the the basis of his argument at the beginning: miracles violate natural law, and then he defined natural law as what can't be violated, and therefore said miracles can't happen. That's that's a loaded definition, obviously. Yeah, it is. But if you, and then, and then you say, well, what happens if you've got evidence that this has happened? He said, well, the witnesses aren't reliable. <laughs> so, you know, it ends up being a completely circular argument. Most miracles in the Bible can't really be defined as violations of natural law. I mean, you, you've got the virgin birth, you've got Jesus' resurrection to a new order of existence. I mean, those the creation in the beginning, those would not fit, you know, normal natural law. But I mean, a lot of things in the Bible actually are not violations of natural law. Somebody sick getting healed isn't a violation of natural law to speak. People get healed all the time. Somebody being dead for a long time and getting raised, well, that that is uh, the only really long one we have, though, is, is the four days with Lazarus. But anyway, <clears throat> so I, I went after Hume, uh, Hume's essay, especially in the first book, and then showed how that really doesn't work. And his essay is really abysmal. I mean, philosophers have been critiquing it for a long time. And most of the, not all, but most of the responses to Hume's essays on miracles, essay on miracles have been very negative. It was, it was written early, I think, and he didn't even follow his usual epistemic approach mm. in that. So, I mean, it contradicts his own, his own usual way of reasoning. And so anyway, getting back to your question about uh, how I would define it. Between God's ordinary working and special divine action, you know, you may not know exactly where the boundaries are, but you can kind of tell certain key examples fit this or that. Just like Samson had long hair before mm -hmm. he had a bad hair day with 
uh, his barber. And, you know, some of us uh, are a little bit challenged. Yeah. Our... <laughs> we have the same barber. We have the same hairstyle. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, between, between, say, a Nazarite with long hair and somebody bald, like maybe Elisha uh, in the Bible, uh, was it uh, Second Kings 2? Mm -hmm. We've got, uh, you, you can get a clear example. So saying that we, we, we see the sun rising daily, that is God's regular working. Uh, somebody getting raised from the dead after being dead for an hour, that is what we would call special divine action. Hmm. So the special divine action outside of what we normally see in a day to day. Right. Okay. Well, then, as we're taking that into the, uh, that definition into account, why, I mean, let me go back. Why is it so important to keep the miraculous alive in our mind today, especially since most people don't discount miracles? But that being said, as I said at the onset of this, you have some within our, our faith say that this doesn't happen anymore. Even though the New Testament is filled with it, they said, okay, that was for then. It's not for now. It all ended. You don't see it through church history. You say, no, that's not true. No, that's not true. You do see it through church history. Um, and, and you don't find anywhere in the Bible that leads you to expect it's going to cease. I mean, just if you're just reading the Bible on its own, you're going to expect this is normal. Mm -hmm. and, and then how do, you, how do you explain the fact that we don't see things more often, uh, at least here in the West? And I think there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, remind, remind me to come back to that, but but first, let me uh, uh, remind me of your initial question. I'm I'm, I'm ADHD, so <laughs> I really basically, am. Basically, we have people within the church today that say this doesn't happen and it's not necessary. Oh, and we need to know why. Why do you have you written this to keep that alive? That idea. Why do we need to keep that in our mind? Yeah, I mean the the first book especially was written primarily to refute anti-supernaturalism. So it was towards human skepticism. It wasn't towards cessationism, the idea that, that miracles have ceased. And really the second book is, is oriented that way too. But having said that, again, there's no biblical grounds for saying it ceased. But I remember I was converted from atheism, from completely unchurched atheism. And when I came into the church, <clears throat> well, I, you know, I had to humble myself, <laughs> eat, eat humble pie, recognize that, oh boy, I've been wrong. I've been saying the wrong thing for all these years. There is a God. And because um, I had an encounter with him, that was how I was converted. But then I, I still kind of had this bias like, well, God can do spiritual things, but I don't think he actually does anything physical. At least I don't expect to see anything physical. And then when I saw a few things physical, that really shook me up. <laughs> that really blew my mind in terms of my worldview. And I'm wondering how many other people are in that kind of, kind of situation. Go back for a moment. You said you encountered God. That was your conversion. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, no, I encountered God through the gospel. Often God will do signs and wonders to get people's attention. We have reports of that all over the world. But in my case, um, some people brought me the gospel. They were probably cessationists themselves. Um, but we didn't really how, discuss. How old were you at this time? I was 15. Okay. So they stopped me on the street uh, to, to share Christ with me. They explained to me how to be made right with God from the Bible. I said, look, you guys, I don't believe in the Bible. I'm an atheist. Uh, I've been an atheist. At 15 years old, 15 years old. So what year, yeah. what year are we talking here and where are we? This is 1975 in Ohio, in Northern Ohio. And okay. I, I had been an atheist, I think at least since age nine, I thought I could explain the universe purely naturalistically. Um, at age nine when i was nine i thought i was a transformer okay. so <laughs> i mean the idea that you're trying to explain the universe and its origin at the age of nine sets you apart a little bit mm -hmm. from different people but you you so you're into this atheism you have these guys these they, yeah. these people stop you on the street and they they talk to you about being right with god then what happens yeah well when i was 
13, I started reading Plato and his, his arguments about the immortality of the soul. And that got me wondering about meaning and, and so on. And so, you know, I, I'd been holding two conflicting worldviews, Platonic idealism and pure materialistic naturalism and hadn't really figured out how to put them together. But one thing I knew I didn't believe was Christianity because it seemed to me that most people who claimed to be Christian weren't living like they believed in a God. If I believed there was a God, I would give God everything because that would be what mattered most. That would be where meaning actually was. And so anyway, these guys witnessed to me. I argued with them for 45 minutes. I walked home and I experienced an encounter with the Holy Spirit. God was there in the room with me. He wasn't going to let me alone. I had studied different religions. I'd studied different philosophies, but this was actually a person. And I, I was like, okay, well, you know, I wanted empirical evidence. This isn't empirical, but, you know, this is like even closer. <laughs> and it's not something that would persuade somebody who was outside of me, but it certainly was persuading me. So I, I said, okay, God, I, I, I have to admit you exist. I don't understand how Jesus dying and how Jesus rising from the dead, how that makes me right with you. But if that's what you're saying, because that's what they told me from the Bible, if that's what you're saying, then I'll believe it. But God, I don't know how to be made right with you. So if you want to make me right with you, I need you to do it yourself. And all of a sudden, I felt something rushing through my body like I'd never felt before. I jumped up, scared out of my mind. Mm. And that was the beginning of my, of my Christian life. And then you know, some other interesting things happened after that. Um, but yeah, but that's not something I can just say to somebody else. And I'll say, mm -hmm. I'll say oh, that's completely subjective, you know. So uh, I, I go for historical evidence and, and so on. The fact that you were reading Plato at 13 years of age is not, in my experience, the people that I've interacted with, that's not always the normal thing. I mean, you're dealing with higher questions of life, even from the beginning, because God is, is, has gifted you in that way and, and used you mightily for the kingdom uh, to write many commentaries. And, and again, going back to the book about the miraculous, um, why does it seem, though, today, and you, and you wanted me to come back to this, that we see the miraculous in majority world cultures, but we don't see that in the West? I think there are a few reasons for that. One is, as, as a lot of my African friends say, we need miracles to survive, you know. <laughs> you in the West, God has gifted you. You have health insurance. You have, you have medical technology. Those are God's gifts. We shouldn't overlook them. When Jesus fed the 5,000. That was, that was a miracle. But he also told his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain. They weren't going to need a miracle for the next meal. God doesn't do miracles just to entertain us. He usually provides for us through, through the means that he's created in the regularity of nature. You know, if you, if you can get a job and you can get health insurance and so on, that's, that's great. Now, also another factor I think is we see these things most regularly. <laughs> now I'm like talking about a different kind of regularity. Mm -hmm. We see these things most regularly on the cutting edge of evangelism. So I have some friends who they'll go into villages where there's no church. There's, you know, it's completely devoted to another religion, often in a syncretistic way or something, but no, but not Christian. And they will say, show the Jesus film will start preaching. People will start getting miraculously healed while they're preaching. Or they'll say, you know, bring, bring us somebody who's deaf or blind. And of course, the deaf people can't hear it. So somebody in the village has to bring them. But these are people everybody in the village knows is deaf or blind. They get healed. And a church is started there the next day. And mm -hmm. this, uh, and I have other, other friends who have gone there and seen it. And then there was another um, there was a group of in, uh, investigators who went there and also witnessed it, tested people before and after prayer, and found that a number did go from blindness to seeing and deafness to hearing. And that was published in Southern Medical Journal in September of 2010. Mm. 
And of course, there was a backlash on the internet. But then you go read uh, Candy Gunther Brown, professor at Indiana University. She was one of the authors of the original study. And yeah, testing conditions in rural Mozambique are not not ideal. But you read her chapter on that study in her book, Testing Prayer, published by Harvard University Press in 2012, it's pretty clear <laughs> that this is what happened. So um, on the cutting edge of evangelism, that's kind of like where the kingdom was breaking forth and the gospels and acts. You see it more regularly there. Now, I have plenty of accounts from other kinds of settings. It's not to say they don't happen elsewhere. Um, and it's a whole lot easier to get medical documentation here in the West than it is, you know, in rural mm -hmm. Mozambique something like that but and then and then i think another factor though is we in our culture have been steeped in anti-supernaturalism and skepticism about it and jesus didn't always do things just because of faith and when he stilled the storm his disciples like we're perishing they, yeah, were, yeah, they, they didn't have faith, faith. Right. but but often mm -hmm. he'll say your faith has saved you so there is i think something we can really learn from our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. And that actually happened to me because when I started investigating, I was, I was thinking, okay, well, you know, I may run across a few stories like, you know, with myself, there was one time where I passed out. I wasn't breathing. I started turning purple. They said, um, they started praying over me. I started breathing again. That was probably just a few seconds, you know, so I, I wasn't, I was expecting to find a few things like that. Uh, but people can recover from that. It doesn't require always uh, special divine action, in a sense. But what I wasn't expecting was to find people who had been clinically dead for more than six minutes and were fine because after six minutes, irreparable brain damage starts in. Mm -hmm. But we have accounts from, from doctors, uh, medical records, for people who were dead for longer than that, eyewitness accounts even for longer than a longer than a day, multiple independent eyewitness accounts, uh, but you know for medically documented well over an hour. And the one that got my attention though was actually something my wife shared with me. I didn't know how long the person had been dead. My wife didn't know that. She just had heard the the story growing up. It actually happened before she was born. So I interviewed the person who was the main eyewitness to that, who was Antoinette Malambe in Congo. Mm -hmm. So Antoinette told me the story. Her daughter, Therese, was about two years old. She cried out that she was bitten by a snake. Her mother got to her, found her not breathing. There was no medical help available in the village. So she strapped the child to her back, ran to a nearby village where family friend, Coco Ngoma Moise, was doing ministry. Coco Moise prayed for the child. The child started breathing again. The next day she was fine. So I asked, how long was it that she wasn't breathing? And Antoinette Malambe had to stop and think, well, they get from this village to that village, uh, this hill, that hill. She said, it's about three hours. Now, that really got my attention. And not just because it was three hours, but also because we know Therese she has no brain damage. She actually finished a master's degree and um, just retired from, from doing ministry back in Congo. And so it really got my attention though because of how close it was. Antoinette Malambe was my mother-in-law. Therese is my sister-in-law. Mm. And well, I mean, these were people of integrity that I knew. Of course, Therese was only two years old. She doesn't remember it. But we did also check, not to that one's mother-in-law, but we did also check with Coco Moise, who also confirmed the, the account. So that got my attention. And, you know, I found other more dramatic things after that. But that one was the one that was close enough to knock me upside the head in terms of my Western presuppositions. When you when you wrote this book, you 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 do talk about miracles, not in the case of like you said, just passing out or turning blue. Not that that can't be that, but more on the dramatic side of limbs increasing uh, in inches. I mean, you you talk about the deaf 
hearing, the blind seeing, those who are crippled walk. I, and I must confess, there were a couple of times where I found myself weeping over j just reading some of the accounts. Um, I, I can't remember her name, but the, the woman who couldn't fit through the door. And uh, oh, yeah. uh, that was just such a striking image to me. And how long is she, how long had she been in a wheelchair? I, I don't remember, but it was many, <clears throat> many years. Um, it was, uh, what was a reflex sympathetic dystrophy, something like that anyway, but she was, she was bent over so far, they had to actually enlarge the door to get her through. And yeah, she suffered for a long time. So yeah, the, the stories in the book, the, you know, there's stories of, of God doing miracles, but most of the people suffered a lot along the way before the miracle. And so it's not just um, making everything sound rosy. But, uh, she was, she had a vision of Jesus while she was on the floor. She, uh, she had fallen out of a wheelchair. She, she had no way she could get back up and she was in great pain. She had a vision of Jesus who came and touched the different parts of her body as they were healed. And uh, her, her kids were, were due to visit her later that day. And when they came in, she, you know, the, the wheelchair was just sitting there in front of the door and they were like, what happened? And she walks in from the other room walking and they're like, mom? <laughs> And yeah. her doctors had the same reaction. This one was thoroughly medically documented, as were a number of other. Well, other well I'm, I'm, I'm turned to it right now. Actually, in the book, you talk about RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Hmm. Um, and you said it was April 1993, where she had a fatal work accident. By 19, January of 1995, her disability had grown more severe. Her left hand began to claw November, Christmas Eve, 1995 was her final complete meal with solid food. And she was confined to a wheelchair by February of 1996. And she stayed in that wheelchair every day for the next 15 years. Yeah. It, and, and that I think was what grabbed me is these weren't just short-term things. These were long-term interactions. And, it, and, and your book is filled with story after story after story. It's, it's one anecdote right after the other where you're, you, you do a really nice job of laying the groundwork, answering questions that people have beforehand to kind of head it off at the past. Like, what about this? What, what if they were really sick? What if this happened? And you, you do a great job of showing, no, there's doctor after doctor that have, have shown this, there's research, there's all these behind it, um, which I found encouraging because you are a world-class researcher. You are a person who whom uh, many people trust to give a really balanced view. And I thought you did. Even there were times where you talk about someone who healed people, but then their life fell apart themselves. And you don't, you don't spare that. You don't, I, I appreciate that because you don't try to make people look better than they are. And yet you're also not unwilling to hit people that some would just consider controversial because they may have a healing ministry of some sort, or at least historically. So, so you hit that. And you do it, I think, uh, as a, um, you do justice to it. But let, let's talk for a moment here on these, these things. Um, the, the dead being raised. I mean, some people would say, really? Really, that's what's occurring? And you're saying, yes, we have documented evidence of individual after individual that's been there. Why is there still so much, though, hostility? And again, I know you talk about Hume and how he is really tried the, his thought processes have, have really permeated. Um, and there's a lot of skepticism. Also, there's also a lot of, the word that comes to my mind is chicanery, but that's a kind of an old word, yeah. you know, um, people who, who falsify the information. I, I don't remember if you, you, you probably haven't seen it, but there was the movie uh, man in the moon about Andy Kaufman and he goes to get healed and he, he goes to the Philippines cause he, he has cancer and he sees, he really believes in this and he gets in there and he sees that it's all fake. Everything is fake. And we know that of people, people have, have really lost their faith because of it. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, God still does it. Mm -hmm. so what, what are we to make of this world in which we live where there is so much skepticism? How do we go about even talking about these things? And yeah. should we seek the miraculous? 
from God. <laughs> yes. I mean, we, we, can, we can pray to God for it. Um, uh, there's so many places I could go with this. First, just to say fraud does occur, uh, especially in those ministries where people are depending on donor funds. Um, mm. They have more reason to falsify something or they want attention or something like that. But you don't throw out the real, real money just because some money is counterfeit. Mm. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm making you have to edit. There was something else. Was, this is part of being ADHD. <laughs> that's it's why. Funny, I, by that's the way, it's everything. funny to me that you have ADHD and you can write as much as you can. Because most people that I know that have ADHD can't sit and write, especially 1,400 pages <laughs> of a text of something. Sometimes um, it's painful, but yeah. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, but going back, should we seek mir the mirac uh, miracles? Should we expect a miracle? In Acts chapter 4, where a disabled man has been healed and the authorities try to shut down Peter and John and, and forbid them to preach anymore, they go back and they share this with the, the congregation of all, the assembly of all the believers in Jesus. And they say, uh, let's pray. And they pray to God, God, please continue to grant your servants boldness by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And it says in 431, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. And so there is a place for that. Now, praying that God will do miracles to bring honor to his name is not necessarily the same thing as praying for this miracle or that miracle. And yet we do see for example, in Mark, we see a contrast in Mark chapter 10. You have James and John who come to Jesus and they say, uh, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Jesus says, what do you want to ask? <laughs> mm -hmm. And they say, well, we want, we want to sit on e either side of you in your kingdom. And Jesus says, you really don't want that. You don't know what it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. Are you able to share my cup? And they said, oh, sure we are. And no, they weren't. But a little bit later, you've got Bartimaeus, who comes to Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Mm -hmm. And Jesus grants it. It's not selfish to pray for healing. But we also need to keep in mind, if God did something all the time we wouldn't consider it special divine action we wouldn't consider it a miracle we would consider it regular divine action people would say well it's just something when you use this formula or whatever it just naturally occurs it's something from your brain or whatever um so there are settings where it happens regularly on the cutting edge of evangelism in other settings it doesn't happen all the time but when Jesus did these, these signs, they were signs of the kingdom. They were a foretaste of the coming kingdom. They weren't the consummation of the kingdom. People still die. People still suffer in, until the consummation of the kingdom. But whenever God heals anybody, or, or God does something unusual, extraordinary, special divine action for any of us, it's it's, it's a gift to all of us because it's a reminder that God hasn't forgotten his promise of a day when there's not going to be any more sickness. There's not going to be any more death. God is going to wipe away all tears from our eyes and all things will be made new. What do we do when God doesn't heal? In the Gospels, we sometimes see desperate people who wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, like mm -hmm. the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7, Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, who says, you know, G Jesus says, it's not, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. <laughs> now, she could have responded to that, like, how dare you compare me with a dog? You know, that was at least as offensive back then as it is today. 
Uh, I used to think it was, well, you know, the word he uses means a little doggy, but it didn't matter. It was still highly offensive. And so, but instead she humbles herself and she just says, okay, I'm, I'm like a little dog under the table, but you know, there's always leftovers. There are always scraps that the children, children drop. You have so much power. All I need is a scrap, <laughs> you know, with the, the centurion servant, uh, in, in Matthew 8, 5 to 13, we have Jesus saying, well, actually, the translations don't always bring this out, but most likely it's worded like this, shall I come and heal him? Don't, you know, I'm not supposed to enter into a Gentile's home. And the centurion responds, you don't have to come. You just speak the word. I understand the principle of authority. I'm under authority. I'm backed by the authority of the Roman Empire. You are backed by the authority of God. You just speak the word and it will happen. And Jesus says, not even among my own people have I found such great faith. Your servant's healed. And so sometimes we need to hang in there and not just give up right away. But sometimes the answer is no. And you see that also in scripture. You see that again in Mark chapter 14, Jesus has been, has been saying all things are possible with God. He says that back in Mark 10. Um, elsewhere, he says nothing should be impossible with God. You know, if you just have a mustard seed, it's enough. You could even move mountains. So in Mark 14, he's praying at Gethsemane and he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Please take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And the Father's will was not to take the cup from him. Because for the sake of the salvation of the world, Jesus needed to go through the cross. He needed to drink that cup. And sometimes God will use our suffering, our disability in one sense to bring him glory in other ways and i can't say why it happens this way with this person and this way with that person i can say there are a lot of different views on that but even the people who say everybody who has enough faith will get healed not everybody in their ministry normally gets healed unless again they're on the cutting edge of evangelism groundbreaking evangelism um, some people see it a lot more than others. Some people have, well, just like we have different gifts. I mean, my gift is more in the area of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and I have some, some other gifts in, in more local settings. But um, uh, by the way, speaking of gifts, I should mention that my cessationist friends, most of them don't deny that God does miracles. They say God is God. He can do whatever he wants to. So they'll say, you just don't expect it all the time. I'm not sure it happened all the time in the first century either. Otherwise, um, the original apostles would still all be with us. <laughs> right. When you're talking about evangelism on the front lines uh, or miracles on the front lines of evangelism, as we were talking in the pre-show walkthrough, um, I told you that I, I pastored a church where we had people that came from Africa and from Burma and uh, Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And I remember being overjoyed because it's my contention that God has brought the nations to us for one of two reasons, either to renew the church or to be reached, meaning that you, you have people that are coming in that are Christian already and some that aren't. Either way, it's win-win to me. Mm -hmm. um, but what often struck me is I would meet people that had been on fire for the Lord. They would talk about the miraculous. They would have these, they had prayer meetings back in their home country and they would come here and suddenly materialism kicked it. They got all the things they wanted and their faith would dissipate very, very quickly, which, which showed me that it's sometimes we see that within the majority of world culture, but we also know how bad secularization can be and understanding how it is affecting us so on and so forth how do we help people though to i'm not sure what i'm asking but how do we help people to really see still and hold on to god's working because we've 
we've been given a gift in what we have here in our culture. And you mentioned that. I'm not saying that we we throw it out, but you 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 made a specific note, and I I've, I've got a point in this meandering. <laughs> At the end of your book, you mentioned that God is close to the brokenhearted, the poor, those who don't have anything else. But I live in a culture James, right now. James chapter two, I think it's around verse five. Has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith? Right. And, but I live in a place right now where those things are all taken care of where there's a lot of money there's a lot of affluence there's i mean they're getting all their kids whatever phones they want picking their vacation destination and yet they're in church on sunday mornings and there's a part of me that feels guilty and wonders why isn't does would god work in this situation and how does that, how do, how do we do that? I, I had um, Philip Jenkins on the show mm -hmm. and we were talking about his book, Fertility and Faith. Uh, and in the book, he documents, I don't know if you've read it or not, but in the book, he documents the uh, fertility rates in uh, cultures of the world. And the more secularized that culture had become, their birth rates would plummet, sexual identity issues would go up etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's my contention that there's a trojan horse that's been brought in to a lot of cultures with modernity the the seeds of the destruction what we think is actually helping the church in the long run can actually harm it so i'm looking at this going okay i'm in a modern western culture right now i believe god does the miraculous and i'm a little envious of him doing it on the front lines and our culture is continuing to become much more post-christian and arrogant uh, to borrow a term we used earlier in the conversation, how, I don't know, I guess my question is, what do we do then? How do we respond? We're not in, this is where the world of the New Testament is very different than where we're at today. We're so affluent. And again, I know in ancient societies, there was affluence. I mean, you have the cows of Bashan. We talk about that in Amos and, um, or one or four, two or something like yes. that. Yes. And, and I, I'm looking at that today going though, okay, what, God has blessed these cultures to be stewards. I mean, it, we have this money, this affluence, but I see it within Europe. I see any place where secularization has occurred, money has come in, and then people start to look at you as if you're a, a weirdo. I, I, and I, I know that uh, I was talking to a, uh, there was a, a church plant, a church, an old Baptist church in Swickley, Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh. So it's a very wealthy area, it has more CEOs per capita, is what I've heard than other places. A lot of the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins and Pittsburgh Steelers live in this little borough. And there was this little Baptist church that was struggling and they were going door to door and knocking on these mansions of people's homes. And then people would answer and say, I don't need God. I've got more than you do. I have all this stuff. And, and you look at it and you go, oh. And I remember talking to a friend who was an uh, Assemblies of God church planner. And he said, we do really well in planning in poor areas. We don't do very well in planning in affluent areas. So I, I, I guess my question is, is should we just deny the affluence and the blessing of God in that regard? How do we even view that and still cultivate this idea and dependence on the spirit of God to work? You do have people in the Bible who were blessed materially like Abraham and so on, especially if they'd already proved their faith. But yeah, um, Deuteronomy 32, is it when Jeshurun grew fat, she kicked God warned that Israel would become, they would start loving his gifts more than the giver. Yeah. And John Wesley warned about that. A number, a number of people in history have warned about that. Uh, the monastic movements, I, I don't think we need to go as far as the monastic movements did, but I do appreciate that they were a witness to the wider church of what really matters most. And yeah, uh, Charles Finney, he was preaching at a wealthy New England church, uh, Lyman Beecher's church, which was very, very prominent in that, in that period. And he preached from Luke chapter 14. Even so, none of you can be my disciple unless you give up all your possessions. And the pastor basically got up and apologized for what he said. He said, don't don't worry, God, won't, God wants you to be willing to give up your possessions, but don't worry, you won't actually have to do it. Uh, whereupon Finney jumped back up 
and said, you don't lose all your possessions at the moment of your conversion, but you do lose your ownership of them. Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. He's Lord of everything. And <clears throat> we, we do see that in <clears throat> um, 1 Timothy 6, God has given us all things richly to enjoy, but be rich in giving. You know, if God has given you these things, be a good steward of these things. Giving is actually one of the gifts in, in Romans chapter 12. So it's not a sin. It's not how much you take in. It's what you do with the resources you have. The, the seven churches in Revelation, two of them, the only two actually that don't receive any rebukes, are the two churches that were suffering persecution. God says to one of them, the church in Smyrna, I know you're, you're poor, but you're really rich. In contrast to what he says to Laodicea, you think you're rich, but you're really poor. Mm. The church in different parts of the world has different tests. And we can't look at somebody else's test and say, oh, that one's easier. I wish I had that one. Or that one's harder. I could never pass that one. We don't get to choose our tests. But to all seven churches, the same exhortation to the one who overcomes, I'll give this. What we can do, we can, we're part of the global body of Christ. Let's listen to one another and learn from one another. And just the same way is on a local level, but the body of Christ has many members. We need all the members and their contribution. We need to learn from one another in the global body of Christ too. We have resources that can really benefit the church in some other parts of the world. I mean, some parts of the world are desperate for theological education. I almost... <laughs> There was a time when I was, I really almost decided I was going to stay in Nigeria and live there, provided I got, you know, permanent visa, <laughs> because the students were so hungry for scripture. And I, I came back because <clears throat> I realized with my writing, you know, the particular place where I would have been staying, the power was off, <laughs> you know, one third of the time. And uh, it, it would be better I could write and then send books there but you know we can learn a lot from one another one of one of uh one of my students at, at the uh, right now i teach at asbury where i taught before was um a, a baptist seminary outside of philadelphia and one of my one of my students was from india and while he was doing his doctor of ministry degree he was also um <clears throat> working security for the for the school because the exchange rate is so so bad between the US and some other countries so he was he was working uh, security one night and I came in from the cold outside and I had a splitting headache and he said oh brother let me pray for you and he prayed for me and nothing happened of course the headache has since gone away but uh, he prayed for me nothing happened I said, that's ah, because I don't have any faith. He said, no, brother, I don't understand this. It always works when I pray for people in India, <laughs> but it doesn't work here. <laughs> he said his church had grown from <clears throat> maybe half a dozen people to about 600 people, all of them from a variety of non-Christian backgrounds because he, he prayed for the sick in this Baptist church. He would pray for anybody who was sick, they would normally get healed, and uh, they didn't all become Christians, but enough of them did that his church grew to like 600, because <clears throat> there there, you really had to count the cost in that culture to become a Christian, mm -hmm. social ostracism, mm -hmm. and so on. Of course, here, like you said, we can be called weirdos, but uh, you know, it was much more serious there. Even family ostracism could happen, although it was a, it was a fairly tolerant and open um, community in terms of uh, religious dialogue and getting along. But anyway, he, he said, these people, they've not been exposed to the gospel. God just wants to lavish his love on them to give them the opportunity. And in the West, you know, you have so many opportunities. So 
again, that, that's not to say we don't pray in faith and hang on, but there are some cases where you see it a lot more regularly than you. I was in India and I had a couple bring me a baby. Baby was dying. You know, the theoretical goes out the door when yeah. you're when you're holding a child that you can tell it's on death's door and all you can think is get them to the hospital. That's my first reaction as a Westerner. Their reaction was, is I'm bringing it to him, bringing my baby to a holy man to pray to God, really. Hmm. And I realized how deficient my, and, and I, I, I just kind of stood there. I mean, I prayed for the child. I never knew what happened, yeah. but that is where you really start to question. I, I find that a lot of churches, like to deal more in the theoretical mm-hmm. and what could the Holy Spirit is supposed to do or what they think he should do. But when they're faced with a reality of a situation that God usually allows to occur for a reason to wake them up out of their, their spiritual arrogance, if you will. And, and that's why I, I do like your book in that it helps me to see that God still does operate that way. It chips away at my skepticism. I, I'm I'm not I, I, I hate to say that I'm a skeptic. People that have listened to this show, my father became a Christian a year before I was born. He was a diesel mechanic, tractor puller, and he got in caught up in the full. And I don't say we we call it the Word of Faith movement now. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was told if he had enough faith, because he started to feel sick, and that if he had faith, he shouldn't go to the doctor, and it got, he's like, oh, I have faith. So I didn't go to the doctor. And they said, if you have faith, you got to get rid of your insurance. So he got rid of all of his insurance. Oh. And then finally he is condition deteriorated so quickly that he had to go to the doctor. And they said, you have lung cancer and that spread to your brain. And then he was diagnosed in August and he was dead in February. I was four. He was 35, just very, very quickly. And the odd thing is, it's not that I don't believe that God heals. I, I still do. You'd think, yeah, I mean, you could have gone a different one a different way, right? As a child, you grow up with that. Either you would become a complete uh, atheist because of that. I, I didn't. God, I knew that God was the, the father to the fatherless, but I also knew there was... <laughs> This is where I'm a little bit like you. As a kid, I went, that doesn't sound right theologically. <laughs> However, I know a lot of people have that. I, I had a, a man at my church in New England who was told that if he claimed it by faith, whatever it was, that it would be okay. And he claimed a year, like this year is going to be our year. We claim it by faith in Jesus name. He lost his job. He had a stroke and then he killed himself. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we know that we all know, we all have stories like this. Mine's not unique in that respect. That's why I find your work in this book specifically encouraging. Because it's a reminder to me that my skepticism and pessimism has been doused a little bit. The fire of my my, my pessimism is doused by the fire or the water hose, if you will, uh, of God's word and that God is still working and active. And then as I went away and I cried reading some of the stories, I, I wanted to know, okay, Lord, I don't want to say I demand a sign. I, I, I don't. But I do, I do want to know more. I do want to know God more because of that. And I do want my brothers and sisters who are of that hard and fast idea that there, is, there are no miracles. This, to me, is a good proof text. That, I don't want to say proof text. <laughs> support, support, evidence, evidence, uh, argument, whatever you want to use um, for that. Is that the hope that you want? I mean, it has to me a couple of places it's almost an apologetic for miracles really it is an apologetic for miracles but it's also an encouragement to believers and a challenge to skeptics mm-hmm. is that what you hope god does with this book yes. yes in fact somebody wrote to me maybe a week or two ago uh, maybe two weeks ago something like that just saying that as they were listening to the audiobook version there was something they'd had for years and they were suddenly healed while listening to the book listening to the book 
li listening to somebody's story in the book. I, I don't know whose story it was, but it was so encouraging to them, to their faith, that they suddenly experienced healing. And that's, um, again, it's not, I just compiled the stories. There, other people went through these things. I mean, there are a few things I went through that are in the book too, but it's God's work. It's not, that's why I, I refused to take any royalties for the book. I said, you know, this will all be donated to medical missions or, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Chauncey Crandall, a cardiologist in West Palm Beach, he, uh, and this actually made local news there and a little bit uh, national for a while. He was um, <clears throat> making his rounds in the hospital when they called him into the ER. A guy had been flatlined there for 40 minutes and he checked everything. They'd done everything they could to revive him. There was no, there was no hope. After six minutes with, with no oxygen, irreparable brain damage starts in. So he signed the death certificate, was going back to his rounds. He felt led by the Holy Spirit to go back and pray for the man to have a second chance. He said he didn't feel much faith. The nurse was glaring at him like he's crazy, uh, but he prayed. They shocked him with the paddle one more time. Now, normally you don't get a normal heartbeat even after a couple minutes of being flatlined, but suddenly the guy had a normal heartbeat and the nurse started screaming, Dr. Crandall, Dr. Crandall, what have you done? The guy's extremities, he was, he was white, the guy's extremities had already turned black from cyanosis. I mean, his face and hands were black from lack of oxygen, but the guy ended up having no brain damage. He did have a second chance to know the Lord. Uh, Dr. Crandall got to participate in the man's baptism, Jeff Markin's baptism. But the backstory of that is that a couple years before this, Dr. Crandall's own son, Chad, died from leukemia. They prayed, they, they, they trusted God. When Chad died, they prayed that God would raise him. He like opened his eyes and then closed them again and he was gone. And Dr. Crandall said at that point, he had to make a decision. Am I going to keep trusting God? God is worthy of our trust when he does something and when he doesn't. He's still trustworthy. And it was because he came through that test that he was ready when the Holy Spirit sent him back to pray for Jeff Markin to have a second chance to know the Lord. I have another friend I worked with in Nigeria, Leo Bawa, who uh, has done his, his PhD at Oxford Center for Mission, Mission Studies. Studies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Leo actually did some of the research uh, for earlier editions of Operation World on, on Nigeria. Well, he was in one, in one village doing, doing research and the neighbors brought him their dead child and said, can you, uh, can you do anything? And I found out about this because when I was writing the first book, I said, well, a lot of my African friends have seen things. Let me just ask Leo if he's seen anything. He said, I haven't seen much. He sent me seven pages. This was, this was one of them. <clears throat> he said, I took the child aside for a couple hours, praying desperately, and then handed the child back to them alive. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe the child was misdiagnosed as dead, you know, how Maybe, maybe if you pray for everybody you think is dead, maybe once in a while it's gonna, you're gonna strike it lucky. I said, uh, have you ever prayed for anybody else who was dead? He said, once, my best friend, he didn't come back. But for God's glory in this, in this village that was pretty much unchurched, when Leo prayed, that child came back to life. What, you know, talking about, raising the dead the the sight the, the deaf which we haven't even talked about you you spend chapters you spend a chapter for each one of these in the paralyzed um one of the things that i thought that I thought was interesting though you actually talk about cancer and in it you mentioned that cancer as we know it today wasn't known in the scripture at that time not in the same way they didn't have they, cancer they didn't like we do today yeah, they didn't understand cancer um 
how then should we understand that from a healing perspective today? Well, we have enough evidence in scripture that God heals that, <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't have to be something specifically named in scripture. Some have argued that cancer was actually pretty rare back then, <clears throat> based on studies of skeletons that have been excavated. Um, there are different reasons for why people think that. Some, some think that most people back then died a lot younger from something else before they got to the stage of cancer. <laughs> uh, and actually, again, thinking in, in terms of the blessings of medical technology, you know, in the, in the period in which the New Testament was written, the osteoarchaeological studies, the studies of the bones that have been excavated in different parts of the Mediterranean world, it's often estimated that the childhood mortality rate was about 40%. Mm. So, you know, today we're way, we're way beyond that, but, you know, it's, it's a terrible tragedy every time a child dies, but <clears throat> medical technology really has been a blessing from God. And so what they taught your father actually was harmful. It, was, it harmed your father, it harmed your family. <clears throat> it's important that people search the scriptures and get solid teaching on this. <clears throat> Just the fact that people, people in the Bible died. That was the normal course of events. Uh, so-and-so begot so-and-so and they died. And um, miracles happen and it's good to pray for them to pray with confidence that God can do it. This might be one of the times when God will do it. So we pray with confidence. Mm -hmm. And we stand with people in faith in their, in their hardship as we pray for them. We don't just say, well, you know, it's all right. You'll die, but you'll go to heaven. I mean, people are hurting. We, we want to stand with them. But sickness and death are, and sin are still part of this, this world until Jesus comes back. And we need to recognize the reality of that, the already not yet of the kingdom. So like when John the Baptist, I know we're talking mostly about scripture rather than about, you know, the examples in the book, but, you know, I'm a Bible scholar, so what am I? <laughs> um, but when John the Baptist sends to Jesus, John had heard about Jesus healing people. But, you know, John had said the one coming after me is going to baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. I don't hear about any fire, you know, are you the one to come? Or should we look for somebody else? Jesus sends John's messengers back to John and says, you tell John what you've seen, what you've heard and seen. The blind see, the deaf hear, the uh, disabled walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. Well, John should be able to figure out from that that these are signs of the kingdom that John was proclaiming, because Jesus evokes two passages in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, the blind see, the deaf hear, disabled leap for joy, and Isaiah 61, the good news being preached to the poor. And in so doing, Jesus is saying, look, these, this is a foretaste of my kingdom. These are signs of my kingdom. And so John, what you did wasn't in vain. The kingdom is coming. It's just not coming quite the way you expected or all of it at once the way you expected. When people say, uh, well, we'll be healed of everything when Jesus comes back. That's not just a cop-out, that's biblical. Mm. But we do get the foretastes now and those are an encouragement to us to hold on. And so these accounts of the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, the, the disabled walking uh, that I have in the book are meant to encourage our faith to just highlight the gift of these healings that God has done for all of us. It's like one person in the book who was basically clinically dead, but I, I put him in the chapter on brain damage because they didn't officially say he was dead. But, you know, the, the, you know, the brain scan, the, almost the whole brain was black. I mean, <laughs> total, total brain damage. His healing wasn't instantaneous. 
uh, in that case, some others were. But he, he, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, I feel like this is a, this was a gift, not just to me, but it was a gift to other people. And that's why I'm willing to talk about it, to let other people know how good God is. And yeah, we go through hardships, but God is, God does show his glory at different times. And he says, I, I don't think God did this just for me. God did this for a lot of people. Talking about the blind, the deaf, seeing the dead. I mean, nothing's more miraculous to me than that. I mean, dead is dead. Um, oh, still in the storms, you know. They're... Well, the yeah, natural, yeah. the natural miracles. You you do talk about that, but one of the questions that I have, and you you didn't touch on this in the book, but in the in a conversation, I was working with um, someone on our team, and their son is autistic, and we had been having a conversation uh, with another person, another person we were interviewing, and he was struggling because we were getting into the aspect of demonization the spiritual world he gets nervous because someone had once told him that your son has a demon of autism and it really crushed him because that just was put a unnecessary weight upon him what did you find in your research though with not just that like let's talk about autism here for a moment because you you mentioned cerebral palsy but what about something like a down syndrome how do we go about that is there healing not that there should be i think that god gives individuals especially the the, the children that i've met with downs or the adults i've met with downs i find it be a great blessing uh in the church today but nevertheless i want to ask the question um is there healing? Not that, again, not that there should be, but is there for them? I, I really didn't research that. There was one case in Brazil of somebody who was claiming to be healed of Down syndrome, and the investigation turned out that that wasn't actually the case. Uh, so <clears throat> um, I don't remember if I came across other cases of that because I wasn't really looking for, for that. It was uh, starting with the the categories that Jesus mentioned, mm -hmm. and a few other things that came up along the way. But sometimes God heals us, and sometimes God gives us grace. I've mentioned I I have ADHD. I should not be able to write these books that I write four thousand five hundred page books. Yeah. Although um, there is the blessing of being able to hyper focus sometimes. Mm -hmm. with ADHD, if you're not distracted, but I had plenty of distractions. And sometimes it was painful for me to just stay doing that research, disciplining myself to do the research. And I've, I've had to find ways to work around it. But I think that that brings God glory that he can, he can accomplish these things through somebody with that. Uh, I don't, disability may be too strong a word. It's not like I'm I, I'm functional. Um, some some people may think I'm not. I, I, socially, I'm a little bit awkward, I'm extreme introvert. Uh, that that actually helps me with the writing. <laughs> um, that reduces some distractions. But yeah, I I I can't answer that based on my own research. Uh, but based on what we know of God, yeah, God can do it. Somebody actually wrote to me and said that he was. He was very short, and he wanted to know if God could heal him from shortness. From... Yeah. <laughs> well, is, God was can. his name Zacchaeus. <laughs> God can't. God can do that, and but I didn't want to encourage him. I mean, I I said God can do that, but you know, God also can work with you the way you are. I think he. I, I may be wrong, but I got the impression that he he was done growing. So. And he was concerned about his height. But, I mean, you've got not just Zacchaeus, but you've got uh, Athanasius, who was yeah, the the black dwarf. The black dwarf. I mean, yeah. you've got people. I know pastors, you know, who are very short, and God uses them in in mighty ways. 
So it's not like whether you're short, whether you're tall, whatever it is, I mean, it's not like God, God can make me thin. God can make me good looking. <laughs> you know, God could give me hair again. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, that's what I often introduce when I talk about miracles. I'm saying I'm not saying that God always heals everything. You look at me, you can't tell right now, but normally I wear glasses. I'm nearsighted, so I don't need them for this. But you know, I wear glasses, I have male pattern balding, and my students often say there's something else wrong with his head. But you know, God God can work through us and in us the way we are, and that's part of His witness to the world. That no matter what situation you're in, God still loves you and God can still work through you. So again, to say that is not to downplay miracles. We need to be led by the Spirit and, mm -hmm. and open to what God will do. And yet there's certain things that he characteristically does in certain kinds of settings. And other things he, he doesn't normally normally do. Or at least often do but like How? like people people who say well have you ever seen a, a, an amputated appendage grow back well i've not seen it i do have eyewitness reports of it and we do have a medically documented case where you know the, the small intestine in an adult it doesn't grow um grow longer it only grows wider but in this case where his small intestine had been so damaged by a diesel truck falling on him he was a diesel mechanic like your father, the, the truck fell on him. The surgeries removing the, the damaged tissue. He didn't have enough of the small intestine to- 112 survive. centimeters is what <laughs> it said in the book. I remember this very vividly. <laughs> your, 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 your memory is better than mine in this. Because <laughs> you needed 600. Every... Yeah. You needed like 600 to, and he only had 112 <laughs> centimeters. It, well, it, it, even before that, precipitated before that, they didn't even know he was alive after yeah. the truck hit yeah. they thought he was dead and it was like 30 minutes or something they're all around and they, they and he find out he's alive it's like well wait a minute i mean that he, even well, itself that he lived is miraculous yeah, he has enough. an experience of heaven yeah but he uh his his small intestine miraculously more than doubled in length at the moment a friend prayed for him in person he felt a jolt through his body he was he was healed and the radiologist confirms this now to actually measure the exact length you'd have to cut him open and yeah. you know stretch out the small intestine which of course would kill him which defeats the purpose of the miracle but we also have other cases where you know after this he got really excited about about healing and he started praying for other people we have another case it's medically documented been written up in a medical journal of somebody he prayed for who had a disorder that's not known to go away on its own ever who had this all his life he was instantly and completely healed <laughs> and so it's written mm. up in a medical journal when you wrote on in the book like you said you use the categories that jesus did but we have other categories where i mean there's healing but then we get into the aspect of demonization you didn't really seem to touch that is there a reason why I uh, didn't want to open another can of worms. The book was already okay. too long. That'll that'll have to be a separate book if 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 there's time to do it. I. It's also not as edifying. <laughs> um, mm. Usually, when I when I teach my classes and I'm talking about say the reliability of the Gospels and Acts, and I get to, you know, we have analogies for these things today. After everybody's all excited about the miracles, I say, okay, now we have to talk about demons. <laughs> not as exciting. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite, uh, yeah, it's, I don't like demons, but I'm glad <laughs> that's good. You're a yeah. new Testament scholar. I'm glad you don't like demons. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but in my first book, I've got about 60 pages, put them in the appendices, appendix A and appendix B, appendix A dealing with what we know about ancient demonology, uh, just working with ancient sources mm -hmm. historically. Appendix B, going to the anthropological literature and showing how spirit possession is widely documented in a majority of the world's cultures. Most of the anthropologists were not thinking when they wrote these studies, these are actual spirits. 
but they documented the kind of experiences we read about in the New Testament that are indigenously interpreted that way. And some of the anthropologists initially loath to put this in an anthropological journal article, but eventually some of them started coming out and saying, I actually think that there were real spirits involved in this. Now, I think that's a minority of anthropologists, but recognizing that, okay, the indigenous interpretation deserves some respect. Missiologists, anthropologists, psychiatrists, sociologists tend to interpret this in different ways. And we can learn, I think, from all of them. But, you know, as a Christian who believes in what's recorded in scripture and the interpretation that's given to us in scripture, I, I do believe there really are spirits. And I could give you a lot of stories about that. Now, in terms of spirits and healing, so you see in uh, Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29, Jesus heals a man who's... Uh, well, his symptoms look like epilepsy, uh, but but he's demonized. He's yeah, cast him in the fire. You cast him into yeah, the fire. Yeah, cast right? him in the water in the fire to yeah. destroy him. And he says, "My son, how long has he been like this? He's been like this since since his youth." Yeah, yeah. So he and had. It, you have to think that. He, I mean, who knows? But he maybe had burns all over his body. I mean, the demon could maybe pr keep that. But you just yeah. wonder what this guy had gone through. This young man had gone through. But keep going. I'm sorry, David. Yeah. No, and there was another. There was another man who had a spirit of muteness that Jesus healed. Um, from Nepal, a pastor testified that there were three sisters who had all gone mute at the same time. The pastor cast out a demon, all three of them were healed. Now, does that mean that muteness is always caused by a demon? Of course not. Of course not, right. And is epilepsy always caused by a demon? No, it's caused by certain things in the brain. So, it, but at the same time, there can be different levels of causation, which through most of history, philosophers recognized <laughs> the possibility of different levels of, of causation. I mean, Aristotle was big on that, and through the Middle Ages, people were big on that. Um, so <clears throat> if, if a demon inhabits somebody, can they cause them mental distress? Yeah, often. <laughs> If a demon inhabits somebody, can they afflict a, a certain part of the person's anatomy? Can they work through natural causes to do that? Yes. But there are also cases where some psychiatrists, and again, I would not say this is the majority of psychiatrists, but like one psychiatrist I interviewed in New Zealand, he was like, <laughs> this is why he left psychiatry. He was enrolled to do a Master of Divinity degree. He'd been a psychiatrist for a couple decades but there were cases where there was no psychiatric, physiological, psychological reason for the, for the way the person was this way. There were, it was just, it couldn't be explained in any other way. Hmm. He and the nurse independently, not speaking about this until afterwards, when they started interviewing the person, the temperature in the room dropped 10 degrees suddenly. Hmm. Um, I have another psychiatrist friend. Uh, she was uh, she was a an undergraduate when I was doing my doctorate, and we met through a campus ministry. And then later on, she became a psychiatrist, and she shared with me stories. She she isn't ready to share her name publicly because you know it could hurt her practice. But there were ca cases where there was no other explanation for this. Uh, I think it's Scott Peck in The Road Less Traveled. He mentioned two cases that couldn't be explained any other way. Now, some of, the, some of these people are minimalists in the sense that it has to be explicable no other way before they'll say it's a demon. And, you know, from a psychiatric standpoint, I guess that's what they should do. I think spiritual things have to be spiritually discerned. So sometimes it can be more than one factor. But... Yeah, it's there's there, one one article said uh, uh, when when in doubt cast it out <laughs> question mark <laughs> no <laughs> it's not always a demon <laughs> so um, sometimes, sometimes it's something else uh, and, and and Catholic exorcists normally they they refer to psychiatrists first and when 
everything else has been exhausted. If none of that works, then they bring them to the to the exorcist. So, but we have so many reports of this. People who trafficked in demons, who put curses on people, and for mm -hmm. people who think that's unbiblical, you, there's no such thing as curses. Just go back and read about Balaam and mm -hmm. Numbers mm -hmm. two or, or whatever. But uh, Proverbs does say a curse undeserved won't alight. So walk with the Lord. But anyway, um, pe people who put per curses on people and they died. Of course, people all die eventually, but they they uh, you know they would die right away. Large numbers of these spirit practitioners have become Christians as they encountered Christian witnesses who displayed access to greater power, who were able to cast out demons and, and so on. So uh, one of our demon students, not d demon, but one yeah, of our d doctor doctorate of ministry. ministry. <laughs> Short form is D-men. <laughs> at, at, at Asbury Seminary um, from, from Indonesia back in 2011, he, he sent me pictures of, I think it was 28, 20, maybe it was 21, um, of these witch doctors, he called them, who were being baptized by him after his preaching in their, in their mountain region because they'd seen that the power of God was greater. It's what missiologists call power encounters. Mm -hmm. So God's power is greater, but is there a reality to it? I, you know, I like to choose my battles and I, I like to persuade people about the reality of God. You know, if they don't want to believe in demons, I'm not, <laughs> I'd rather persuade them about the good side. But at mm -hmm. the same time, there is a reality there. So I can share this from my Congolese brother-in-law who has a PhD from France. Well, he's deceased now, but had a PhD from France in chemistry, he was a chemistry professor at the University of Brazzaville, man of science a no-nonsense kind of person, but he also was a Sunday school teacher. And in his Sunday school class, uh, they had a pretty big Sunday school. There were these three boys who always stuck together. I even hate to tell the story. Do you want me to tell the story? Uh, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, just go ahead. Uh, if it doesn't work, we'll edit it out. It's, yeah, it's a horrible, it has a happy ending, but it's a horrible story for the people who don't make it to the ending. So there was three three boys who always came to the, the class. One of them fell sick and after a couple of months he died, upon which the second one fell sick and after a month he died, at which point the third one came to the Sunday school teachers and said, please pray for me, this is what happened. That, that months earlier they'd met a man on the street at night who said that he he had magical powers, he could give them spiritual power, they'd become government ministers or whatever, he just needed to take a little bit of their blood. So he cut each of them with his knife. And one night, the first one, the, the eldest boy had a, a nightmare in which that same guy from the street stabbed him with that knife. He immediately fell sick the night that he died, the second one had the same nightmare. The night that he died, the third one had the same nightmare. Well, the guy on the street had said, don't tell anybody this. You know, it's just a secret. That's how it will work. It obviously wasn't working. So he came to the Sunday school teachers and they took it seriously. They prayed and fasted during the day for nine days, came and prayed for him. He was healed. And uh, years later, when I talked with my brother-in-law, he was still the, the young man at that point was still still fine and hadn't come back. But just to say, okay, well, you could try to explain that psychosomatically, but personally, I think there are other explanations that are simpler, <laughs> more economical to use econo uh, to use Occam's razor. Mm -hmm. um, just a materialistic worldview excludes these things. But if you don't a priori exclude them and you're not totally reductionistic, there is evidence for them, even in the anthropological literature. Edith Turner, 
a lecturer at the University of Virginia, spent decades, I believe, in, in uh, Africa and elsewhere as an anthropologist. And during a, a spirit, a traditional religion spirit ceremony in, in, I think it was Zimbabwe or Zambia, um, she said she witnessed this green blob come out of the person's back. And she said, okay, I'm tired of pretending that as an anthropologist, I have to impose a Western grid on everything. Um, the indigenous explanation makes a whole lot more sense for this green blob coming out of the person's back where there was no orifice or anything. And so now she teaches her students, she's editor of an anthropology journal, Anthropology and Humanism. She teaches her students to experience spirit possession as a cross-cultural experience. Now, obviously in seminaries, we do not teach our students to do that, <laughs> okay? But just to say, it's not just from a Christian perspective. There are reasons to believe that there are real entities involved in this. But whether a person believes they're real entities or not, the descriptions in the gospels certainly fit, and acts certainly fit what we have in the anthropological literature, these observations by people who didn't even believe they were real spirits, usually. And to say that that's no reason to discount the accounts we have in the gospels. They mm -hmm. could very easily go back to eyewitnesses, which I think they do, but um, that's, a, that's another story, uh, another, another episode or whatever. Another episode, another episode. Well, I, I, I want to finish up here. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being so generous with your time and willing to discuss the book. Um, how can people and, and on something other than demons, please? <laughs> yes, no, no, no. Let's well, let's do that then. Let's talk about because really the hope is is that God works, that God is still working in our world. God heals, and as you said, these are foretastes of the kingdom. The this is what we have to look forward to is the culmination of the time that we are with Him, and He will remove every tear from our eye and 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 heal. The ultimate healing occurs when we will be with Him, and we shall see Him as his, as He is, for we shall be like Him. And it's, it's, it's incredible to me that we're already partakers of the divine nature and something that I'm still trying to, I think we are all trying to wrestle with and try to understand these glories that God has enabled us to be a part of. And while we know that the, the demonic world is loosened for a time and that there is evil in the world, it's so clear. And in our culture today, people, I think, are becoming more aware of it because it's so such a departure of what they have known, what they grew up with, and the fact that we're much more aware of things technologically. Um, but we do know that God is ultimately going to be victorious, whether we're talking about, uh, it doesn't matter really about the culture per se, but we know that God's kingdom is going to, to, to happen and, and it's going to be consummated. And for that, we can, we can find hope and an encouragement. And that's why I think that your book is so important for us to, to find that encouragement today, to be reminded that God, excuse me, that God is working and has been working and transforms hearts and transforms minds. In ways that we don't always feel, we we expect, we try, we hope, we pray, and we we fight, as you said, we continue to barrage heaven, if you will, holding on to God. Um, and and I love how you gave blind Bartimaeus, you know, when they tell him to to be quiet, and it says he shouted all the louder, yeah. "Son of David, have mercy on me!" I love that passage. There's a, a pattern, yeah. Uh, of people coming to Jesus, they're the ones whose stories get told the most, you know. Yes. People who wouldn't let the crowd deter them, they opened up the roof above Jesus. To yes. And that's the that's the encouragement part to know that God is near to the brokenhearted. And that for all of those who are listening today, that they we don't want you to be discouraged. You might wonder why you haven't um encountered healing yet, but hold on. And 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 God might again, like we, we could talk about those that God may have allowed this for a time for his reason, for his glory. We don't know. And he wants to increase our faith in the, in the midst of it. We don't know these things. We don't have the complete mind of God and understand everything that God has done, but we trust. Johnny Erickson Tata. I mean, she is great example. He's done so much as a disability advocate that, mm -hmm. you know, God uses her in that, that situation and in, in a, in a just, magnificent uh great way and, and I, I i've been reading another book uh renovate by jim wilder a neurotheologian and in it he's talking about dallas willard and 
Dallas came to him and said, the Lord has told me that I have a year left. Hmm. And, and it's like, he knew it. He knew he, it, it got allowed that for him. And that's exactly what happened. He found out he had cancer and then it slowly just weaned away. But we do know that God allows these things to shape us and that he is going to accomplish his will. And as C.S. Lewis said, he's good in the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, he's not a tame lion, but he's good. And whatever God does, we know that it's for our good and that he's going to accomplish his purpose and we need to trust in that. So I, I really want to thank you for coming on the show and be willing to talk about this book and for writing the book to be such an encouragement for the body. You got any concluding thoughts for us? Yes, I thought I should mention, because sometimes people say, ah, well, that's a one-off. Well, we have a, if it's a one-off, we have a whole bunch of one-offs. So <laughs> let me just respond to that. You know, they say it's, it's an anomaly. You can, you can, you can say that so many times, but after you get enough anomalies and there's a pattern to them, you might start thinking that your worldview needs to be ready to accommodate right. this. And so there was a Pew Forum survey that was done uh, was it 2006, where you, you put the figures together from this survey, you've got hundreds of millions of people globally who claim to have witnessed or experienced divine healing. Mm -hmm. Had a survey done of a thousand physicians in the US where over half of them said that they had witnessed miracles. And, and keep in mind, you know, the, the physicians are trained. I mean, they're not all reductionist. To question, right. A lot they're of they're trying to question. <laughs> but the, yeah, they're trained to, you know, if something could be explained in another way, that's how you normally do it. It could still be God's providence, but, uh, but who had seen things that couldn't be explained in another way. Um, and the, the context of that question was miracles like the kind that are reported in the New Testament. So we have lots of people, lots of evidence, and we don't need to be bullied by people to say, uh, can't believe that. Look, people aren't always going to agree with us, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we don't have good grounds to believe what we believe. Well, this, that's, that's an amen, uh, an amen and an amen to conclude with that. And again, Thank you for coming on the show. I do recommend people read the book. They'll find a tremendous amount of encouragement. And God bless you and your ministry. And thank you for coming on Apollos Watered. Thank you, Apollos.